Welcome to my Bob Thurman podcast. I'm so grateful some good friends enabled me to present them to you. If you enjoy them and find them useful, please think of becoming a member of Tibet House U.S. to help preserve Tibetan culture. Tibet House is the Dalai Lama's cultural center in America. All best wishes. Have a great day. This is episode 132, American Buddhism, Understanding Labor Day. Greetings, podcast wallas. How are you? This is Bob Thurman, and... Uh, I'm speaking a day or two before Labor Day, but now you are going to hear this, I hope, on Labor Day. Because labor is what we are doing nowadays. We are laboring under a strange and chaotic situation. And uh, a not-so-chaotic tyranny, actually, which is actually pretty purposive uh, to extract you know, more and more of our life force from us, indeed. And resources and everything, you know, and uh, but luck, but in one way, maybe it's lucky that it's so crazed too, and that it would be more effective if it if they weren't so crazed. So my concern today, my focus today on on this labor is on the labor of women. Actually, I want to focus because this is the important labor that we need for life. Of course, labor is used in that way for giving birth for the labor, the tremendous effort that it is to help an infant that has been nurtured and created and, and gestated in the womb, and built up into a small, viable human body, to then be uh, coaxed out of that place of protection and nurture and out into the world where, for where the self and other seems more differentiated, where there's no one else in, there's, they're not inside someone else's skin. And <clears throat> someone else's life force is not in, uh, supporting their life force in the same direct way. Blood and, and, uh, and, and energy, blood and hormone and subtle uh, life force in the, in the being. There's a wonderful book by a female sociologist from New Zealand called Marilyn Waring, which is called The Labor of Women, Counting for Nothing, and uh, which shows how the world is still skewed in this androcentric way of thinking that the men are doing everything and everything revolves around them. And ignoring, and, and of course, ignoring the fact that the, the women are the ones who actually make it work, who make it viable. And she has an extreme example that I always remember, but there are so many. It's a very, very powerful book. Very, very, you know, data rich, and, and, but very uncompromising and unflinching at looking at the data. And the example is a mother in, in one or another, maybe Congo, who sleeps at 11 p.m. if she's lucky and is up at 3 a.m. And she sleeps that late because she has to get everyone else somehow fed and, and warm and healed and whatever it is, whatever local wounds, and then things cleaned and then preparing food for the morning. Then she has to go get up at four because she has to go some far distance to go to a market to get the funds, to get the food for the next day, and the water and all this. And this mix basically gets, they live on like 50 cents a day or 30 cents a day, they, she and her whole family. And she works like 20 hours on that day. Contrasted with a guy who is in a missile silo in Kansas or somewhere in Russia, but she uses Kansas. And they just sit there with a key and a button in front of them in case an order comes through to destroy millions of people. And they're reading magazines, this and that, and they're getting pensions and like $60,000, $70,000 a year. And their labor is valued, which is really not labor. They're just waiting to execute a command, which of course is a deadly, destructive command. 
as a kind of extreme example, you know. And all men, no women in that profession. And she has lots of other more juxtaposable and easier traditions, but it's very, very dreadful and terrible. Now, we just had this stolen election, another stolen election, like the one in 2000 and, two, 2000 and 2004, where the Republicans suppressed the votes and rigged things in states where they had their own secretaries of state ensconced, their own governor, because <clears throat> of their strong funding that has been given to state races by the oil industry people. And uh, where Bush stole it from Gore and then from Kerry. And now we've had another stole theft from Hillary, the first woman who would have been our president. We just had the first multiracial person, Obama. We can't say black. We have to say multiracial. He's half white, half black. And then now we have the first, um, we would have had the first woman. We, the first woman did win our election for all of her problems as a campaigner and all the, all the difficulties of, uh, of the, her advisors and inability to get along with the people of uh, Bernie Sanders ilk, who were more in touch with the pulse of the people who felt left behind, etc., the people who rallied behind Trump. But she still won. Trump still would not have won if they hadn't suppressed hundreds of thousands of voters in states where they won by 15,000 or 30,000 or 80,000. They suppressed hundreds of thousands of voters, not to mention whatever crooked counting were done. But the, the crookedness of it's overt that we don't even, that we know, is the, the way they mismanage the vote and they use ID laws and they use all sorts of things from the Voting Rights Act having been destroyed by the Republican dominated Supreme Court. Um, and also the money involved, you know, uh, by the Citizens United from the Republican Supreme Court. They completely stole this election. And the woman who should be our Angela Merkel for all of her ups and downs and problems and the people around of this and that type, she should be the, the channel, the mediating channel that is the president for those different factions and desires and, and interests, you know, as they lobby and push for their, for their benefit as opposing the benefits for the others. And she was supposed to do that. It is the time in history when we need the women to get in there and balance things, where the male force and the male tendency to violence and the male tendency to seek judgments and the male frustration and therefore greed and dissatisfaction with things have created this oligarchic planet, militarized and consumerized, dreadful sort of Hermes, you know, like Louis Vuitton, um, net jet planet that is so destructive to the environment and destructive to people, to the vast majority of people. We need the mediating female presence who will also be imperfect, like our multiracial guy was imperfect. And also our, the guy who robbed it, Bush Jr., was not completely bad. He could have been worse. And we're now seeing a guy who may be even much worse who seems to be already from the beginning worse, but not even trying to pretend to be somewhat good in some respects. You know. So we really reached the limit, the obvious self-destructive limit of what this kind of greed, this elevation of money, greed, power, and aggressive delusion has placed upon the planet Mother Earth, Gaia. And so we more than ever need Angela Merkel's, you know, in every position, you know. In France, we have a male, Macron, but he has a very wonderful wife who has a major influence on him, which he, which he will be keeping, whatever the formal position the French people will allow. And uh, the other males everywhere are just too machoing it out and wrecking everything. So we should have had that. So we didn't have that. So then the women marched all over the country and they showed that they didn't accept this theft and they are going to like put a stop to it. And they are going to stand against this violence and this destructiveness. And they are not going to get exhausted and they're going to get back to Congress and the, even with the crooked gerrymandering and with the voter suppression and everything, they're going to be such a strong force because, you know, the numbers are just against this kind of 
you know, co-optation and destruction of democracy, because if everyone participated, the key thing they do with their propagandistic media is they make people discouraged in thinking that my vote will be meaningless and it doesn't count and it doesn't matter and everybody's bad anyway and so who cares who's in the office and now we can see clearly every time after the bad one gets in we see how it does matter and how there is a difference sure i'm so upset sometimes now with democrats who are aut autopsying the election and it's like oh, of course we hillary was such a terrible campaigner it's all her fault but actually she won they keep they're forgetting that she did win it's just that the margin wasn't as big as Obama, where the cheating of the oligarchy, the, the oligarchic party, the fat cat Republican party, the cheating was overwhelmed by the margin. And she didn't have that strong a margin because partially some fools, you know, who were turned on by Bernie, Bernie Sanders, who was good for them. And in a way, they are not ultimately foolish, but they were fools, relatively speaking. You know, the whole stupid thing that the super liberal does where they say, lesser of evil is useless, I'm tired of it, I want real evil, and then we'll have real good. You know, they, they have that kind of argument. And they don't follow the idea that lesser of equals equals less evil. They somehow can't get that one. So they get in there and they take away these, their spoilers, they take away these margins, and they allow the really bad guys to get in. That's, what, that's how Hitler got in Germany. People don't remember. He was elected. Because the German socialists said, oh, we're sick of this status quo. We want the bad guys to get in for a while. Let them have a taste of the bad guys, and then they'll love us. Ha! They flattened the whole country, the bad guys, provoking the rest of the world to do that. And then they also flattened other countries and did horrible atrocities in the, in the full, under the full power of the bad guys. So it, lesser of evils is very important. That's how you work towards more freedom from evil. You don't expect perfection toward the good. You don't let the perfection be the enemy of the of the real and the and the good. You know, as they say, they're saying like that. Okay. Anyway, so that's the thing. So now my focus on women and their labor now for Labor Day has to do with the fact that how can we feminists, male feminists as well as female feminists. How can we, well, and I hope to count myself as one, although, you know, I don't always get received that way by everyone, because I have my bad habits still from my culture, I can confess to, but I try. And anyway, so how can we see to it that the March on Washington, wearing the pussy hats, if you will, and all of its forms in political runs for the school board and runs for the sheriff's office, runs for run for the, the judiciary. So that all of these, you know, that the female force intensifies. And especially in 2018, that 100% of the women vote. Why not? Why even let's shoot for 80? Let's say 100% of the women vote. To everyone's amazement, don't necessarily tell the pollster you're going to do it, but do it. Register, everyone. Don't tell the people when you register necessarily. Say you're independent. Don't say it. Don't telegraph so that the people won't disqualify you in some way. Or put a bad voting machine in your precinct if there's too many of you. If we have 75% even vote, we'll easily win back both House and Senate. For sure. Easily. If if 100% voted, you know, who knows, we would get impeachment then after that. Of not just the president, but also the, the negative fanatical vice president, who is not really good at all. He's he's one of the one of the oligarch servants, totally. So, uh, and then then maybe that will be able, we will be able to bring out some better and good Republicans. There, after all, have been good Republicans, and there are Teddy Roosevelt. They, maybe they did some oligarchic things too but they did create these national parks they did do good things these current guys are not conservatives i can't i can't bear it when they say jeff sessions is a conservative he's a radical these guys are trump is a radical not a conservative he wants he just want he's he's a radical narcissist he wants everything for himself he doesn't even care about the country which is really wrong in the president he doesn't serve anybody but himself. 
and even his family he doesn't serve himself. So he, he was misplaced there. Actually, it was for people, demagogic people like him, that the Electoral College was devised to see if people were swayed by media or by emotion of the moment or by manipulation to put an unsuitable person that they could then go against the tyranny of the majority for a person who was truly unfit. That was what the, that was what the Electoral College was for, not just of being a rubber stamp. That's ridiculous. Anyway, the labor of women. So then again, I heard someone say that Hillary Clinton is thinking of running again, and some people around her want her to do so, and so forth and so on. And in this first of all, all going berserk, oh, that'd be terrible, we could never win. She did win. She has every right to run again if she has the strength for it. I'm not sure she should, but it's her decision. She did, she would be running what Gore did not do. He was too, he didn't want to get dirty again or something. He, he had, did win and he should have run again. You know, he should have run as the president coming back from exile in 204. He should have 100% run. Different vice president for sure, but he should have run. So if she runs again, it's an age thing, it's a health thing, it's a whatever. But as a woman, I'm sure I bet you Elizabeth Warren would say, yeah, I would prefer Hillary runs. Because she won. She has the priority to run. And the nonsense that then we'll lose again is nonsense. We won. And if, you, if they would unite now behind whoever it is, we would win again. Even better. If there would be no... Bernie Sanders would be 100%. She, he should have been the vice president. A ticket of Hillary and Bernie. That would be tremendous. Hillary, Bernie. And if to, to really make sure all the Bernie Sanders people come aboard... Hillary herself goes out and redefines the vice presidency in such a way that it's a truly partnership, true partnership. She makes him equal in decision making of different kinds and role in various roles and makes joint decisions with him and makes a pledge to do it. And they show that on the campaign trail that they work together 100 percent. And he completely hunts down any super pretend mega liberals who actually would be harming things by acting like nothing is good enough for them. And of course, the, the, the oligarchs will put in democratic spoilers like Jill Stein. They'll put in people like that to try to knock out 5%, whoever they can. They'll do it. They'll pay for that. Anderson in the Reagan election, they do it every time. They will always do it. They, because they are a minority, the rich ones who want to take everything away from the majority. They have to do all kinds of strategies of disallowing the votes, and changing the ID laws and disenfranchising people who committed small felonies, uh, you know, because they didn't have a good education, didn't have a job. And then they get them in prison for five years or three years, and then they let them out, but they can't vote. It's Jim Crow, new Jim Crow. They, can, they have to do all these kind of things to be elected because there's only a, a small minority that like them. It's just that they only survive by getting the majority to fight with each other. And to quibble like, uh, oh, you're not liberal enough for me. I love critics of the of the state and of those. I love these people, whether they're right or left. I think they're great. They should be always criticizing. But when they get to where they're criticizing, where the whole thing is no good, and we need that when they become rad radical, so that the person who likes their positive criticism is then dragged into a condition where they're made to feel that nothing will help. That they, in other words, they're deepening their despair. That, I think, is negative. And that serves the minority. Because if people don't get out to vote and they're not active and they're not optimistic and they're not hopeful, they don't have that energy of we can do it. Yes, we can. You know, the, the Obama tap, the yes, we can. Energy. If they don't have that energy and they don't turn out, then the bad guys can stay in charge. They can stay in charge. So therefore, the super critic who says, hey, everybody is a mass killer or ever been president since the beginning, you know, the genocide of the Native Americans. It's all true. But there was there's some ideal that's churned there in the middle why we have some happiness in our society, a little bit in some parts, bigger and smaller parts at different times. It's because we have happiness in our charter, unlike other places where they just have discipline, do what you're told, tyrannies and authoritarian societies more authoritarian societies. We have happiness in our charter.
And therefore, it's not all black or all white. There's always, you have power. You do it. You make your vote. You register yourself. You run for this. You speak up in the coffee shop. You speak up in the waiting line at the drugstore. And you'll have, you will make progress in the fabric of the weaving of the society, which is that's where the women ex have excelled. They've been driven only to that. And they should also have leadership role. They should also have labor that is honored and, and compensated honorably and status and so forth. Certainly. And, that, and for that, we need this leader who has been deprived of her position in the White House, Hillary Clinton, or someone like her. We need a woman. Um, a sane man who was a feminist would do, but but, we, but it would be good at this time to have a woman. It's time because we have to. We don't have a lot of time the way things are going. And the woman is the natural ecologist. The man is not. The woman is more natural in her looking at the... Echo means the household, you know. The study of households, what makes households thrive. The woman is aware of the, the sewage and the septic system and has a natural awareness that enfolds the entire house where the guy is in there like doing one thing that they think is so great. In general, we need the leadership that is a more holistic view. So I'm not running for, I mean, I'm not on anybody's campaign thing at the moment. I'm just saying that my concern and what I want to talk about today is how to empower the female force, the Gaia force, to sustain the woman's march and realize it's a long march. It's, it's our long march to victory in 2018 and then victory in 2020 and then victory for the rest of the century because we'll be going toward ameliorating climate change. We'll be going to rebuild properly, free, you know, like safely from floods. We'll be going to rebuild the lower classes, not just the middle class, but all of the classes. You know. We'll be going to rebuild everything and not just our economy in a nationalist way, but also others' economy. We'll be going to rebuild the places where the 80 million people are running away from now because of the violence from our weapon industries. We're going to do that. All of them. We're not going to do like a ban. So, so I think the challenge during this fall for me on the sort of public level, this, this little small current I have going on the public level, and I hope it because it, I hope I think there are others more strongly than me, like my beloved Marianne Williamson, I know is doing very active energetic work. Deepak, who has become a feminist, I believe, too, is doing energetic work. So a lot of people, other than me, really important people. But how to keep that Washington march, the Pussy Hat March, alive right up into through the 2018 election and on? How to keep it, the energy sustainable? How to see to it that people are not discouraged by bad things that happen and desperation and 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 they're not ang and another way of being discouraged is to become so radical that you become so angry that you just think it's all hopeless and you just become bitter and and uh, and vindictive and for example the violence among the resistors of the antifa sort of thing I really hope to not see flourish I really hope that's that we that we won't see any more of that I mean we might be, but it will probably be paid for by the oligarchs, because that's a way of discrediting the resistance and discouraging those who are resisting out of love and joy and beauty and confident self-confidence and not out of despair and violence and bitterness and resentment. That's how we must do it. That is the women's way they do it. That's how they manage in the middle of all these catastrophes and disasters to at least keep some people alive, to keep some children fed, to keep some people at peace with each other within their own families and so forth. They, that's how they do it. They don't give in and concede to despair and anger and bitterness and etc. Because if they do, then the, well, then it's gone. You know, when they go join that sort of male tantrum syndrome, then it's finished in that family or that place or that community. Then it's over. But the Gaia Codex beautifully chronicles this, by the way. And another book I would recommend, and maybe I can work out to have her on my podcast so I can join hers is the wonderful Rihanna Eisler. I don't know where she is or how what's, what she's up to right now. But she has a wonderful institute called the Partnership Institute, I think it's called. She envisages the partnership society where the new age finally results in where male and female are balanced. Not female dominance, not male dominance, but a balance. 
prevailing female really can work cooperatively and mutual respect and mutual sharing of power and each one taking turns with the sort of the, the power in any particular decision and as my wife so eloquently teaches actually a partnership thing each one is equally responsible and so on that's what we must seek that's what we're looking for we're not looking to have men groveling down we're looking to have them in a state of having equal partners giving them the strength that an equal partner can give that a slave cannot give to you you know because subliminally there's something wrong and imbalance in the relationship whereas an equal partner can give you this different type of support and strength you know and you to them give them a different kind of support and strength and both of you are free because you're equal so Rihanna Eisler, The Chalice and the Blade, is the book that I read. And I'm sure she, I think she has written newer books. And I confess I am a little bit behind on that reading list from what I've kind of work I've had to be doing. But I strongly recommend that. And underlying that, you will, through her, you will discover the archaeological archeolog work of Maria Jimbutas, which gives you a different myth than man the mighty hunter, than the myth we are given of our natural aggressiveness. And how that's what has made human species succeed and blah 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 meanwhile it's our habitual aggressiveness that is going to could destroy us in a 15 minutes if people if uh, if our aggressive macho male leaders would press some nuclear buttons and tens of thousands of these destructive hate bearing missiles your nuclear reaction chain reaction is a reaction of hate coming through atoms and subatomic particles it's pure hatred Destroying something, destroying itself. So, um, and everything else with it. So we don't need that. So how to keep ourselves, this is what we all need to contemplate on. Probably Michael Moore's soliloquy down in New York is probably touching on this theme. So I don't pretend that I'm, gonna, I'm spearheading anything, but I just do want to do my part in that. So I'm going to try to interview and then perhaps at Menla Mountain Retreat, I will try to organize a conference at some point and bring together more of the sort of women, powerful women, or, you know, maybe they probably making their own conferences, so I may, I may not have to worry about it, but if they don't, I will try, okay? And program those in as we're programming for the next year and so on, up through 2018. So that's what it is today, labor. So today we should celebrate the labor of women. Guys, the, you should help in the kitchen with the cooking. You should wash the dishes. Kids, you should make sure your mom, if, she ha if you have to need her supervision because she is the best cook, you should see that she has every assistant ready to go shopping, to do whatever she does if you have a family party, or you should take her out somewhere. You should really celebrate the labor of women in every level at every stage and respect it and venerate it, recognize it, inventory what goes on in the household, see where they function and what they do and where they could be helped better and where the men could join in and so joyfully and where this would create more or less pressure and more joy and so on. This is, this is, this is our job on Labor Day, especially nowadays, to correct. Of course we honor the hard-working stevedore, the macho male guy working on the farm, the, the guy working in the steel mill and the hot thing, a man doing the, you know, the different traditionally male jobs, you know, the police who are gentle, who don't just use the, their monopoly on violence legitimized by the state to violate people and think that that's the thing you, that, that they can do what they want because they're cops and so forth, but the really mainstream good ones who are there to protect people and be gentle with them, actually, which is what protection means. So that, you know, and then, but there should be more females in that job, of course, and more, it's, it should, and those police forces should be more multiracial, of course. So we celebrate male labor, of course, we don't ignore it, but especially we need to take, because we've had this special thing where we were to have the respect for female labor by having a female president for the first time in the history of the U.S., a little bit exemplifying our ability and potential of reaching that goal among all men are created equal, all humans are created equal as they would have written today. Not all men, but all humans are created equal. 
and they would have shown that we can flourish under female leadership in that symbolic sort of place where you mediate so many things where you become this special type of super servant of the of the people you know the chinese imperial thing had this at the confucian base of that imperial thing was the idea that the emperor is the humblest lowest they had a special pronoun that only emperor could use for himself uh, or herself some occasionally there was an empress chan i believe it was you pronounced and I can sort of see part of the character, but I forgot a little bit. But that Chan was the, instead of war or whatever other personal pronoun, in the, you know, I pronoun, you have ego pronoun, you have. This one was the I, the most humble being. Because the idea was that the, that the needs and interests and desires and necessities of all the people and of the, with the help of the energy of the ancestors in heaven and then the divinity or spirit that may be there, go through that, flow through the person of the leader. And that, that therefore that person is the servant of all the people. And whenever a dynasty in China flourished and the people flourished and the weather flourished and the harvest flourished and et cetera, et cetera, was when the person in that position really honored that tradition and felt themselves the servant of the people. And when they collapsed the dynasties is when the Generations later, the kids are not brought up right. They just indulge in harems. They forget the source of their wealth and their power. And that is the people, and they do things that harm people, and they're just completely out of touch. And they're not—they don't serve as a channel. They're just like constantly indulging themselves. And when that happens, it's the end, the end of an empire, which we have to hope is not the end of America. It, we, it would be okay if it was the end of the American military empire. We really shouldn't be having a military empire. There is no military empire. Nobody can have a military empire in a planet of educated people, of free people, of people who are using their human life to the full potential of learning what they really are and what they really can be. The people who are really being all that they can be, which is not people in the army. It's people who are using their individual life to bring out their love, to overcome their hatred and their anger and their fear and jealousy and pride and bring out their humility and their love and their kindness and their creativity and inventing beautiful things and making things and making other people happy and so forth. That's, that's being all that you can be. Being an artist of your life, of your own life, whatever your profession, making it an art form of your being a member of being, having your role in your family, you know, being the best possible dad, the best possible mom, the best possible son, the best possible daughter, best possible brother and sister. That's being all that you can be. Best possible friend and neighbor. Best possible enemy. Wanting the enemy to, wanting to find a win-win with your opponent. And to cease the relationship of enmity, which is so uncomfortable for both sides. So that's labor. That's Labor Day, labor of women, intelligence of women, kindness of women, love of women, and dignity of women. That's what we want to put in our pipes and smoke it <laughs> throughout the working season up until the solstice, and up until the, the, the winter solstice. Okay? So thanks a lot. That's our podcast for today, for Labor Day. Enjoy the day, enjoy the evening. This episode of the Bob Thurman Podcast was brought to you by Sacred Stream Foundation, located in Berkeley, California, who will be hosting a series of talks with Robert Thurman this September in the California area on his latest publication, Man of Peace, the illustrated life story of Tibet's Dalai Lama. For more information, please visit bobthurman.com. Weekly interstitial music provided by Tenzin Chogel, all rights reserved.